Go on. Let's see here. I'm, I'm watching the YouTube as well. I think I'll go ahead and get started, and I think it catches up. Great. Um, OK, so I uh, wanted to go ahead and welcome everyone to our latest edition of Kiva Insights. Um, this is a really great way for lenders to kind of interact directly with Kiva staff. Um, and so we are joined by a number of really great guests today. Um, wanted to go ahead around the room and introduce everyone. So from the Kiva side of things, um, we are joined by Giovanna Mashi, who is our Senior Director of the Global Portfolio. Hi, Gio. Hi, everyone. Um, we also have uh, Johnny Price here, who is our Senior Director of Kiva Zip. Hey, Johnny. Hi there. I like you got the tag down there, too. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks to Ruben. I want to figure it out. <laughs> we also have Catherine Wu here, who is uh, the uh, Chief Product Officer and also created a title. Um, uh, and then uh, on the lender side of things, we're joined by a couple of people who are really active in our lending teams. Um, so first we have uh, Ruben Quast, who is a captain of the Nerd Fighters. Um, he's also on several other teams like Friends of Bob Harris uh, and Mile Point, among others. So hello, Ruben. Mm -hmm. Hello. Um, and then last but not least, we have uh, Sharon, who is on many teams herself, like the Late Loaning Lenders, Give Green, um, and then she's a captain of Wheels and Watermelon. Hey, Sharon. Hi. All right. So um, in keeping with kind of this ever-evolving format um, that we have, uh, we got a lot of great feedback. And this time around, we're going to spend the whole Hangout on lender questions. Um, and so with that in mind, I want to go ahead and get started uh, with a question that Sharon had. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to her now. One thing that I have noticed on a lot of teams is that many of us have our own favorite countries to lend to, favorite field partners, and Kiva has a lot. There are more than 200 active field partners right now. So something that I was wondering about is how Kiva initially developed some of those relationships with the field partners, how we make the initial contact with the organization, and then once we've made that contact, what's the process that we go through in order to actually build that connection and decide which field partners we're going to work with and which field partners we're going to continue working with over time. Great. So I think that Giovanna, you're probably the best one to answer this. Um, so yeah, go ahead. Sure. Uh, can you, you guys hear me? I can, yeah. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So that's a really great question. Um, we find potential field partners in a variety of ways. Some of it is through conferences, historically through microfinance conferences in different regions, uh, or just networking with different associations in regions uh, that work in the microfinance community. And that way we get to know uh, different organizations that exist and understand which organizations are really in need of funding and are really socially focused. Um, and also really get the word out there about Kiva um, and what we're trying to do and the type of capital that we provide because it's very different than other types of capital that they might be used to. So really trying to find which um, organizations can be the right fit for Kiva and a lot of that is just talking to people to the executive directors to managers of different organizations and explaining how Kiva works and that they have to take a picture of the borrowers post it to the website which is just really different and not exactly a capability that some organizations have um, and a lot of it you know particularly depending on the region that we work can be developing some personal relationships getting to know people asking about the family and kids and you know I before taking on this role worked in Latin America and that's how you gain trust um, with people. So it's a lot of just um, getting to know people and um, then learning a lot about the organization uh, and particularly what do they want to do with Kiva's capital? Um, what type of loan product or population do they want to serve that maybe they wouldn't be able to serve with other capital that they can receive? And do we feel as Kiva that that's um, socially valuable and the best use of our capital uh, and of our lenders' capital, quite frankly? So uh, a lot of that is getting to know the organization, um, knowing the market that they work in, uh, even talking to other partners that we might have to have a sense of 
is this really a product that makes sense to fund, for Kiva specifically to fund? Um, and then we look at the risk of the organization, uh, depending on how much money we're thinking about giving them, we'll go visit them on site and spend two or three days with them visiting borrowers, getting a sense of how they treat the borrowers. Um, is this the type of organization that makes sense for Kiva to work with? Um, so sometimes it can take several months um, before an organization can become a Kiva partner, uh, again, depending on the kind of size of the organization and the amount of capital that we want to provide them. Uh, so it can be a lengthy process, um, and uh, a lot is helped by references and connections to other people and other organizations in, in the region um, to understand uh, the reputation of the organization and whether it's the right fit for Kiva. Does that answer your question, Sharon? Yeah, can I ask a follow-up? Yeah, go for it. Um, so one of the things you mentioned is you said we need to decide, we being Kiva, whether it's socially valuable and appropriate for the lenders. Is there a particular rubric for that, or is it a one-by-one -one evaluating that field partner? Because I know our field partners are so diverse, one from the next. So I'm interested in what kinds of categories would make you choose to include or decide not to include a particular partner. Sure. So we have a rubric to determine um, the general social performance of a partner. So on our website, you'll see those badges. Um, and that's a scorecard that we use to determine how well is an organization performing on different um, aspects around savings, around providing additional services around the loan, um, poverty focus, things like that. Uh, so that's a standard that we do across our partners. Um, but we also look specifically at what kind of uh, funding they would like from Kiva? Are they trying to serve a population that other organizations in that country aren't serving? Are they providing a product like a solar lantern that is really, you know, in need in that region because electrification is really low um, and bar the, the potential borrowers don't have cash on hand to pay um, straight out for the solar lamp, for example? Uh, is it a product that is uniquely positioned for Kiva's 0% capital. Um, we have a lot of partners, particularly microfinance institutions, that have said to us, we wanted to do XYZ project forever, but no other organization will give us the funding because they're worried that it's maybe a little bit too risky or that they just don't have all the information about it. And that's maybe something that um, Kiva can help support a little bit more and help spur that innovation. So we try to look for organizations that are um, willing to go deeper to find populations that are not being served, to find products that are in need in the market. Uh, and so that's a more one-by-one -one evaluation and dependent on our understanding of that country, of that market, and the needs of, of, um, of that community, and also of what other funders are doing. So we have relationships with other funders, and we'll know if everybody else is funding this product, maybe that's not what Kiva needs to be funding because that's maybe not the most socially impactful thing that we can do with our capital. So uh, it's a little, it's at that level, it really becomes a one by one um, evaluation. Great. Um, so I actually have a related question um, that one of our lenders, Amy, asked. Um, how does Kiva know that the client protection principles, um, after we've developed these partnerships, how do we know that those client protection principles are being enforced? Uh, what mechanisms do we have to kind of check on that? Sure. sure. So uh, I think this is a challenging one and, and one that we're constantly thinking about how to, um, how to improve and ensure that um, we're monitoring this in a, you know, as much of a cost-effective way as we can. Um, so we particularly with our partners where we've uh, done a full due diligence, which is the highest level of due diligence, we go to visit them at least once every two years and we visit borrowers and a sample of borrowers and ask them a set of questions about um, their loan and ask them, you know, what's the interest rate on your loan? What are the terms? What happens if you don't make, miss a payment? And sort of try to get a sense of what they say and do they understand the pricing of their loans? How do they um, 
uh, get grievances addressed. Um, and similarly, when we do um, every 18 months, we send a fellow um, to do what we call a borrower ver verification, which is an audit of a set of borrowers to determine whether the information posted to Kiva is, is factually correct and that borrower exists. Additionally, we've added a set of questions around client protection um, to get a sense of over indebtedness and the understanding that the borrower has of the loan. Uh, and finally, again, through our fellows, um, each fellow at the end of their placement at a given partner answers a survey about what they've seen around the collections practices of that partner, um, what they've seen around um, how they deal with grievances, things like that. And so through a variety of mechanisms, we, we are able to get a sense of where are there issues bringing up that we need to dig deeper or where are things, you know, um, pretty much as we expected and as we knew that they were. Uh, right. So it enables us to, to pick places where we need to dig deeper if, if something, you know, a little bit out of the usual turns up in one of these audits. Great. Okay. Um, so one of the big topics that I've seen uh, a lot of people talking about in lending teams um, is the high number of loans that we have on the site right now um, and then the increase in loan expirations that comes with that. Um, so I wanted to spend just a, a few questions kind of talking about that dynamic and kind of um, the marketplace fluctuations between the su supply and demand side of things. Um, so not, not to pick on you some more, Giovanna, uh, <laughs> but we'll, <laughs> we'll involve you and then Catherine in a second too. Um, but I, I guess, could you talk a little bit about why um, the loan volume is high right now and what are some of the challenges in predicting um, how our marketplace will swing from too few loans to too many? Sure, so this is a really challenging um, question at Kiva and um, the marketplace is swinging from one direction to another and quite frankly this year has been an interesting year for us uh, where we started off the year with the first three, four, five months almost with relatively low number of loans on the site um, which is unusual for us at that time in the year and um, quite frankly it came very unexpectedly um, and there were a variety of factors that were even out of our control that caused low supply of loans and then almost in an instant in a matter of a few weeks we went to seeing expirations um, and that's really the fastest swinging of the pendulum that, that I've seen in my time at Kiva. Um, so it's something that we're trying to understand a little bit further and it's challenging because there are many things that we're learning of what we can control and many things that we just can't control. And so we're trying to determine how can we give partners more information about when is a good time to post on Kiva and when is not a great time to post on Kiva. And we've started experimenting this year with sending emails to partners with information and graphs um, about historical postings. Um, but some of our partners are not particularly tech savvy and that information isn't as digestible. So we're trying to experiment with different ways that we can get that information out there for them to be able to use in a way um, that, that makes sense. But there's some cases that we could tell a partner that June is a terrible time to post, if it is, um, but there are partners um, like Strathmore, I know that there's been a lot of questions around Strathmore, um, but their seasonality can't be changed. They have a one school year and students go to school um, you know, in August and so they have to post the loans in June um, if that student wants to go to school because they need the funding from Kiva to be able to send that student to school. So while we might be able to tell them that, oh, supply is high right now, it's not a great time to post, for them it's like, well, that's the only time I can post. Um, and so it's ultimately up to them to determine if it's um, a risk that they're willing to take. And um, so there's that, 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 you know, we, there's seasonality of our partners, and some partners have more flexibility in their seasonality than others, and so giving them information might enable them to make different choices. Um, but there's also things that, we can control if, if we think about, we don't work in Egypt, but if we think about what happened in Egypt in the last week, that happens in the places where we work and that means that partners suddenly completely drop off posting and those are partners that we rely on to um, post a significant number of loans to the site and suddenly they stop all in one go and we have few loans on the site. So, uh, you know, or vice versa, something happens where they're in need of a lot of capital at a certain point that we weren't expecting because of some macroeconomic event um, that you know just means that they start posting a lot and so there's certain things that 
the, the pendulum will always swing a little bit. We'll have moments of high supply and moments of low supply. And for us, it's trying to understand what is the balance that we're trying to reach? What is the right balance? And then how capable are we and what levers do we have to reach that? Knowing that we're not always going to get it right because there's so many things working in 70 countries with 200 partners that we just can't control. Hmm. Great. Um, so when you look at the demand side of things, um, I have a question here from Betty um, in one of our lending teams. Um, she said, uh, there are currently over 3,000 loans on the site. Um, what strategies is Kiva adopting to make sure that those loans get funded and that we don't end up with a major expiration crisis like we did a little while ago, um, referring to, I think, last year primarily? Um, so Catherine, I think you're probably the best one to answer this one. Great. Yeah, and it's a great question, and I'm really excited to be able to share some of the new stuff we've been trying to do here. Um, as you can imagine, we're always trying to encourage lenders to make more loans because that is what it's all about. Um, one approach we take is to always be trying to attract new lenders in new and different ways and build awareness out in the world. Um, you know, a lot of people have never heard of Kiva, and we're very aware of that. So we're always trying to kind of create new channels to reach out. Um, so July is actually going to be a pretty exciting month for us. Um, we have a bunch of partnerships um, lined up, and one of them I can talk about, which is happening this week. We are reaching out um, to Do Something, which is a really active um, user base of youth who want to get engaged in philanthropy and volunteerism. And we are doing a partnership with them to encourage kind of teenagers around the world to get active, start making loans through some free trials, um, but also spread the word through social media, um, which will be definitely a, a youth awareness play. But we've seen actually oftentimes um, people find out, lenders find out about Kiva through their kids. Um, who encourage their parents to start making loans. So we think there'll be a secondary effect from that. So that should be happening this week. Um, there is going to be a national TV media event this month that I can't really talk about yet, <laughs> but you'll be hearing <laughs> about it. Trust me, you'll, um, we'll be getting the word out about that, and I think that's going to be a great example of how we can reach people through TV. Um, and a few occasions in our lifetime when we've been on TV, um, some of those occasions have been really impactful to help us spread the word to kind of the mainstream audience. Um, the other thing that we're really starting to do more of is reach out to corporate partnerships as well um, to kind of reach their customer bases or their employee bases. So, you know, last year we did uh, a partnership with TripAdvisor that went really well that their user base was really excited about where we encouraged um, TripAdvisor uh, people who were making reviews about a country that Kiva worked in. Um, those people were being offered um, a free trial through Kiva, or actually a promotional gift card through Kiva, to um, come and make a loan in the country that they had just visited. Um, similarly, and this is where I can't get into all the details, um, yet, but we're um, in talks with a few big um, companies who have big employee bases, excited engaged employee bases, um, and sometimes global employee bases, to um, help teach their, uh, spread the word about Kiva to their employees, and then therefore have their employees then become advocates, hopefully. So can't really talk about those because they're still um, in the works, but we do have a couple more of those types of events lined up for later this year, which we're really excited about. And one thing I just want to add on the new user front is we often get attention or, or become newsworthy through some of the innovations that we're making on the loan side, you know, new partnerships, new loan types, pilots like Zip. So you might see some themes of that in the up upcoming announcements that we have where we really use a moment of, of, of innovation to um, create some buzz. Although, you know, that new type of loan might not be the majority of the loans on our site. You know, those are definitely newsworthy events. So that's on the new lender side. I have more. Um, so yeah. for sure, we're always trying to also, on the existing lender side, encourage and remind people um, to make loans on Kiva, particularly those who have balances. You know, Kiva is very lucky that we have the, um, loans instead of donations, so those loans do repay and people have Kiva credit that they can then reuse, as you guys know. Um, so, you know, you may have noticed in the last couple of years, we've sent a lot more email reminders to folks who have balances 
to remind them to relend. And those have been wildly effective. Um, people really see that as a uh, helpful reminder that they have credit to spend. Um, we're, you know, as always, doing social media and outreach through lending teams, as you guys know. Um, but we've also been testing new and different programs um, that have seen some promising results. So one recent test we've done is a partial bonus, which um, is a, a, a bonus of an amount of less than $25. So some, for some people, they received an offer of a $5 bonus or a $10 bonus. Um, that then, combined with their existing Kiva credit, could help them make a loan. And so that's a way for us to activate people or encourage people who have even less than $25 to make loans. Um, and so that we got some pretty good results from that. And then some of you guys might have heard about a team milestone uh, program and incentive that we tried out a few months ago. Brandon was instrumental in helping us out. <laughs> Um, but we found a team that was the atheist team that was nearing um, a, a membership milestone, and we um, what was it twenty five thousand or how many? Membership? Yeah, um, so I, I think that they were um, getting close to ten million, um, and okay. they had about ten days um, until right. um, that milestone. Yeah. So we reached out and we rallied the team around kind of reaching the shared goal of reaching that milestone, and that seem to be really interesting and fun for the team too. So and it works. So we're trying to be really creative here on the lender demand side of things to kind of create engaging ways to rally people around making loans. And one more thing I just wanted to share that's in the works is we're working on ways to make it a lot more convenient um, for people to relend without, you know, those people who don't necessarily always want to be coming back to the site. And picking loans, we're working on ways to make it more accessible and easier for them to relent regularly. So, a lot, a lot going on under the hood here. Yeah, that's great. Um, and actually, uh, Ruben, I know you have a related question about um, mm -hmm. kind of the the new users. You guys have uh, a ton of members in the Nerd Fighters, yeah, um, and, and many of them kind of came in through those free trials. So, yeah, go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, back in uh, March, uh, I ran some numbers and I found out that. Uh, around 75% of all our members have either made zero loans or just one loan, presumably a free trial one, but that's presumed. Mm -hmm. um, and we were wondering, uh, what is Kiva doing and planning on doing on uh, keeping these lenders engaged and uh, making them lend more of their own money rather than just promotional loans? Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. So. Um, Thank you so much for, I mean, we, we owe the nerd fighters so much for helping us really <laughs> spread the word to a whole huge base of new lenders. Um, and when we launched the free trial program, this was front and center a big question for us. We did not know how many of those people were going to become repeat lenders and put in their own money. Mm -hmm. So I think at that, when we started the program, we thought, yeah, maybe 10% would. Um, if you look at, if you compare it to other businesses who have like free trials or free free periods. Um, mm -hmm. What we've actually seen on average um, after a year is a 15% of the, of the free trial people go ahead and make their own deposits, which okay. was better than we expected, but we still want it to be higher, of course. Yeah, of course. <laughs> so we're not, you know, just sitting around and not doing anything. So we've tried a couple of things. Um, for one, each repayment that comes back even though that user, as you probably know, that lender is not getting the money back in their balance, we do send them an email kind of helping them share in the success of the borrower. Mm -hmm. So that's, those are occasions at which people do decide to make their own loan. Um, at the end of the loan term, when the loan is fully repaid, you know, on average it's about a year, um, we send an additional email um, that says, hey, now that you're trial is over, why don't you uh, relend? We were frankly pretty disappointed with the results of that. Um, we thought that maybe people were waiting until the very end when their loan was fully repaid in order to make a new loan. But what we actually found is the, the biggest jump in the percentage of people that put their own money in is on the first day um, when they make their first free trial loan or at the, in the first month when they get their first repayment. So we are thinking of and looking into ways where we can actually encourage them to make that second loan right after they make the first one, which might seem counterintuitive. 
Um, but I think there's opportunities we can do that, like right, you know, we call it in the post loan or on the thank you page, you know, right after they make that first loan. Um, and then the other thing just to note that we've seen since, you know, the year or year and a half that we've been doing this is gift occasions, like during the holidays when people are buying Cuba cards for their friends and family, is a, a big motivator also for people to put their own money in. And although those are often in the form of a Kiva card that goes to somebody else, um, that's still a, an activation moment where they're reminded of Kiva and how we are actually useful to, to help them solve their holiday gift dilemmas that many mm -hmm. people have. So um, with around the holidays and around um, like Mother's Day, which is another gift occasion, um, we're thinking of ways where maybe we could talk to the free trial folks a little differently, you know, and tailor custom, you know, custom of, customize a message to those folks, kind of encouraging them to not only make a gift, but also think about making your own loan, something like that. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, Ruben, did that answer your question, or did you have any follow-ups? Um, yeah, I might have a follow-up. Um, okay. We have also a lot of young people um, mm -hmm. who maybe just don't have the money to make Kiva loans. Mm. And is there any way in, in which Kiva is trying to keep those lenders engaged? Maybe uh, I, I've seen a few people who uh, who started translating uh, some stuff and is, mm. is Kiva encouraging that sort uh, uh, that sort of volu voluntary stuff? Yeah, no, that is a, a really good question as well. We've been talking a lot about youth um, because of some of the partnerships that we've been um, creating and also uh, because we know that there's a lot of enthusiasts who don't lend you know like a third of our users who sign up and register don't ever make a loan so uh, yeah that's a great question I think one idea that we've talked about is yes t helping them learn about ways to get involved that don't involve lending which might be like translating as you mentioned or just even sharing the world, sharing the, uh, spreading the word through, you know, Facebook or Twitter or whatever, or inviting folks. Um, our bonus program is something that any user can participate in, which is if they recruit a new lender for Kiva, then they get a twenty-five dollar bonus that they can use to make a loan. So that is one way that they can participate. Um, a bigger, more crazy, innovative idea that we've talked about is actually reaching out to corporations or people like Reed Hoffman who might have um, you know, pools of, of funds that they could put up for lending and allow, like Reed Hoffman did, other lenders to pick where those loans go um, and pick which borrowers those go to. So we have been also talking to corporations and other major supporters to put up funds that maybe then could be used by anyone, including youth who might not have access to their own capital, um, make loans. So we have really realized that the youth market is, a, a, or you know, youth in general are very active and they have high potential to help us spread the word and get active even in ways outside of putting their own money in. Great. Um, so the next question, I actually have uh, a few questions on Kiva Zip um, for Johnny. Um, but first, I think it might help um, if, Johnny, could you talk a little bit about um, some of the recent uh, tests that we have done uh, with KivaZip on the, the lending page, the Lend page? Um, and what have the learnings been so far? Yeah, so we've been running a number of uh, tests on the, uh, on the Kiva Lend tab um, with respect to um, putting uh, KivaZip loans on there. Um, the reason for running those tests is that the KivaZip pilot's now been running for over 18 months. We just passed a million dollars of loans and a thousand, uh, a thousand loans that we've made. Um, so we're really excited about the growth that we're seeing. Um, and the plan was always that once we've kind of proven the model, um, and once we're starting to see some encouraging results, that we would um, increasingly look to integrate the two models and, and post Kiva zip loans on the Kiva website and allow Kiva lenders to use their credit to fund Kiva zip loans. We did that back in March when we launched it, uh, Kiva zip in Little Rock. We allowed Kiva lenders to use their, to use their credit uh, to make Kiva zip loans 
And then, yeah, as, as some lenders have noticed, in the last few weeks, we've been starting to post some Kiva zip loans on, on the Kiva Lend tab. Um, so there are a number of tests that we, that we ran. Um, uh, we put uh, some Kiva zip loans um, in the US filter on the Kiva Lend tab, for example. Um, towards the end of these tests, we put a link to Kiva Zip um, in the nav at the top of the Kiva homepage. Um, when when lenders made uh, key, when some lenders made Kiva loans uh, in the light box uh, that pops up to say thank you, um, we ran one test that then encouraged them to check out Kiva Zip. Um, so we ran a number of tests. We actually ran seven tests. Each of those tests was up for a short short amount of time. Um, we're really trying here at Kiva to um, you know adopt and embed a culture of kind of continuous learning, of experimentation, testing new things, learning lessons, and then implementing them quickly. Um, so the good news is that there were two tests that we found to be uh, really successful. Uh, the first is to put a link to Kiva Zip in the nav at the top of the Kiva homepage. Um, and the second was that light box test that I mentioned earlier. And so we, we've already rolled out uh, the light box test. So now when you make a loan on Kiva, many lenders will see a link to say, why don't you go and try out Kiva Zip? Um, and the link to Zip in, in the nav will be coming in the next couple of weeks or so. Um, when, when I say successful, I think I'm talking about two things. Firstly, they encouraged a lot of uh, Kiva lenders to go and try out Kiva Zip and see if that was a, a way of lending that they were um, interested in and, and attracted by. And the second uh, way it was success successful was that those two tests did relatively less to take volume away from other Kiva loans, uh, which is important to us. Great. Thanks. Um, so I had a, also a couple questions from Denise um, regarding Kiva Zip. Um, the first is, uh, can we get more Kenyan loans on Zip? And so, what are the challenges there? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we really want to do that. We're trying to do that hard. We we've posted <laughs> over 700 loans in Kenya on Kiva Zip. I think we've posted about 300 in the U.S. So we have more than double the number of loans in Kenya than in the U.S. Um, one of the issues is that those Kenyan loans are very small. Um, so on average now, Kenyan loans are about $150, uh, whereas a US loan on average is about $4,000. So you know, there's kind of 30 Kenyan loans per one, one US loan. So they fundraise very, very quickly. Um, and that's why often when you come to the Kiva Zip Lend tab, you'll see a lot of US loans and not too many Kenyan loans. Um, Obviously, you know we're we're trying to address that. We're trying to scale up um, quickly in Kenya. Um, we have a number of fellows who are on the ground right now, and they're they're running experiments, different experiments, to try and uh, you know identify the biggest dominoes to scale in Kenya, um, and you know uh, kind of generate validated learnings with which we can knock those dominoes over and rapidly expand the number of loans that we're posting in Kenya. Um, we have, we're still planning uh, for the rest of this year and next year. Um, to, we're targeting roughly posting four times as many Kenyan loans as we're posting US loans. Um, so we're still very much uh, you know, looking to grow the number of loans that we're making in Kenya significantly ahead of the number that we're making in the US. Um, I think that one of the big challenges right now is is um, that our, our platform is internet based. So for a Kenyan borrower to get on um, on Kiva Zip, they need to fill an internet uh, loan application. Um, one of the tests that these fellows have been running over the last couple of months is around uh, having that be an SMS based loan application. Um, and so we're in the process of starting to build out Did we lose Johnny there? Mm -hmm. No. Well, we'll uh, we'll get him to pick up in just a second. Um, that's actually it's fortuitous timing. I know Sharon, you have to leave in a little bit, and so um, before heading out, I just wanted to give you an opportunity if you had any other questions, and if not, we can uh, go on to the next one. Um. No pressure. <laughs> 
So a follow-up that I guess I could throw out there um, is I know that some of us have talked about field partners leaving Kiva. So I don't know whether that's in Giovanna's territory also, but you've talked about building the relationship in the first place. What does the reverse part of that look like? What are some of the reasons that field partners at Kiva terminate their relationships with one another? And what is that process? How does that process work? It's a great question. Sure, yeah. Thanks Thanks for bringing that up. Um, that can be more challenging, as you might imagine. Um, there are you know, a variety of reasons why um, Kiva partners might um, leave the platform. Uh, unfortunately, historically, many of the reasons have been due to credit issues, problems repaying Kiva lenders, um, fraud, whether or not Kiva related, but sometimes uh, microfinance institutions are can be susceptible to fraud um, because you're dealing with cash um, uh, in the field with a variety of different people, um, and so sometimes I've seen that take down an institution, and so those kinds of um, uh, reasons can be challenging because we work with the organization to see how we can get our lenders paid back. But if um, the organization isn't getting um, payments back from the borrowers or just doesn't even have enough money to operate and liquidates, sometimes there's not much we can do. Um, so that um, can become challenging. At times, we've engaged lawyers um, to try to uh, negotiate settlements or, or come to some kind of agreement. Um, but again, that can be uh, really challenging. Other reasons, sometimes organizations have just decided that you know, we have enough other sources of funding or right now um, taking the picture and writing the stories just is more complicated than we can handle as an organization and sometimes the organization just decides that it doesn't make sense for them at this time. Um, and, you know, sometimes we work with an organization because we've determined that even though I feel really good about all the organizations that we partner with. Um, sometimes there have been organizations that, while really amazing, there's not a clear need for them to have 0% capital from Kiva. And so we talk with them about, hey, have you thought about how you might want to use our capital to innovate and create different products or serve a population that you otherwise wouldn't serve? And, and sometimes in those situations, they say, you know, we're doing well, we want to keep doing what we're doing, and we say, that's great, but I think that Kiva's, like, lender's capital isn't being its most impactful within this organization as it could be somewhere else. And so we sort of work together to determine an exit plan where um, we wind down and um, they repay us over time um, as their borrowers are paying back. And um, surprisingly often that's been um, a not terrible conversation because it kind of becomes a mutual agreement that maybe this isn't the best fit anymore. Um, and, you know, relationships sometimes run their course and um, <laughs> we just try to we just try to work through that and um, make sure that it's working for them and for, for us and, and for our lenders and that we feel good about where our lenders' money is going. So in those situations, it's just a lot of conversation again so that they understand what we're trying to do and, and give them the opportunity to think about how they could use our capital. And if there's just not a right fit for them, then, then we talk about an exit plan. So something that I've seen posted on several discussion boards that I'm on about that um, is questions about then whether Kiva is pushing towards riskier kinds of places to invest the capital. Um, because it sounds like microfinance institutions that are doing a really great job with maybe some of the bread and butter microfinance loans are exactly the ones that it sounds like you're saying we're maybe pulling away from because they're not being innovative. Um, and I know that a lot of the Kiva lenders that I'm friends with really support these simple, basic microfinance institutions. And I'm curious how Kiva draws that line between wanting to be innovative, but also wanting to support good, solid microfinance work um, and to, to minimize the risk that we're sus making our lenders susceptible to. Absolutely. I think that's something that we, we think a lot about and um, is something that we've continued to ask ourselves and determine what the, what the right balance is. One thing I'll say about um, 
the 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 risk pieces I think a lot of institutions um, as you said are, are doing kind of the bread and butter microfinance and um, have an interest to do something innovative or something different that um, is sort of perceived as risky that may not actually be risky. So it's something that we're seeing is there's a difference between perceived risk and actual risk. Um, and a lot of uh, many funders and organizations are worried about the potential of risk and that something is, seems risky and therefore may not want to do it, um, whereas actually the repayment rates are not you know, much different. And so that's that's one thing that we think about. We don't want to just go throw money after, you know, the craziest types of projects ever. Um, but things that um, actually work, but in certain contexts have stigma, not might be exactly the right word, but something that it prevents people from taking that leap. Um, but at the same time, kind of bread and butter, regular measure finance, I think will be present at Kiva in, in, in mass for a while because I think what we're trying to do more is diversify and um, see that in certain contexts, if you think about markets um, that are very saturated with microfinance services, Peru, Cambodia, Nicaragua, um, they're like Kiva being another funder in that market providing the same kind of service, that's that's, it's not a bad thing, but there might be other things we could be doing and that market might need additional products and it might be time. South Sudan, um, Sierra Leone, uh, even places, Costa Rica, like those are places like let's just keep doing microfinance. Like that is great. And let's work with some of the best institutions that we can find that are incredibly socially driven that on those social performance scorecards do really great. and. You know, we have this partner in Colombia, Interactuar, and I went to visit them, and they we are supporting regular microfinance with them, but what they do is astounding. You know, the services that they provide around the loan, they have a whole campus, they help borrowers put nutritional labels on their products, um, they have a chemistry lab where they kind of test the nutritional content. Like, that is amazing. That is what we should be supporting. And that's completely fine with us. But, you know, trying to diversify and create a mix. And it's really important to think about the market, really. And I think where we're trying to diversify a little bit more and push our, push our partners to do innovative products is in those particularly oversaturated markets where there's risks of over indebtedness and where we don't want to be a contributor to that. That's great. Thanks. Um, Johnny, I, I know that uh, you got cut off just a little bit ago. Um, Sorry about that. Oh, no worries. Um, would you, uh, you want to pick up where you left off? <laughs> Do you remember where you left off? <laughs> And actually, I'm, I'm sorry to, to cut you off. Um, would you mind maybe um, turning up your, your mic volume a little bit? You're just a little bit quiet. Uh, yeah. Or just... I'll just talk loudly. OK, great. Um, so I think it's kind of ironic. I was talking about technical challenges in Kenya, and then my uh, <laughs> laptop died. Right. Uh, but what I was saying is that one of the big challenges we have to uh, growing in Kenya is that our loan application is currently internet-based, and many of the borrowers that we're reaching uh, don't have easy access to, to the internet. Um, their trustees can help them with that, or they can go to an internet cafe um, to, to try and do it, but it's just time-consuming and difficult. So we're in the process right now of building out an SMS-based uh, loan application, which is one of the number of things that we're doing to, to really try and uh, you know, automate the Kiva Zip model in Kenya and really, um, you know, substantially grow the number of uh, Kiva Zip loans that we're making in Kenya. Hmm. Um, and so uh, there's actually uh, another question um, about Zip um, in kind of different marketplaces. Um, I, I think many of us are familiar with um, the marketplace in Mexico. Um, uh, which is kind of notorious for having extremely high interest rates. And so Denise was, uh, was also asking um, if there's any chance for Zip to expand in, in a place like Mexico. 
Yeah, that's a really good question. One of the um, one of the things which we're doing right now is starting to explore, um, you know, which should be the third country that we launch Kiva Zip in. Uh, we launched in the U.S. and Kenya, um, mm. part, partly because we have offices in both these geographies, um, partly because the M-Pesa mobile payments technology in Kenya makes it um, very easy for us to disperse and collect repayments in Kenya. Um, and partly because in the US, uh, we feel like the connections that we're trying to cultivate on Kiva Zip um, can be more uh, meaningful. You know, I can actually go and visit the coffee shop um, that I just made a $25 loan to, which is across the street from me, for example. But yeah, we're also starting to think about what should the third country be. Um, so we've thought about Tanzania and Uganda because there are cultural similarities with Kenya. There's also a very high penetration of mobile payment technology in those two countries. Um, and Mexico is another one um, that we're looking at as well. There's some interesting developments in, in the mobile payment space. Um, and to the, um, to the question, uh, you know, that mic microfinance in interest rates have, have been kind of historically a little bit high in Mexico. So that's certainly a very attractive market to us. It's also geographically close to the United States. It has a large population. So it's certainly one geography we're considering for country number three. But just to set expectations, that probably won't be until at least the second half of 2014. We think we still have a lot of work to do in improving the Kiva Zip model, um, getting our repayment rates a little bit higher, um, and just kind of uh, making sure the model is, is really humming and, and working robustly before we export it to country number three. That's great. Thanks. Um, so related to our, our conversation we were just having um, about risk, um, I actually have a question from uh, a lender, Amy, um, and she says, uh, or she asked, does Kiva have any plans to modify the risk disclosures um, to take into account the greater risk that Kiva is pushing into the portfolio? So in other words, a historical 99% repayment rate, which goes back to the beginning of Kiva, um, she said is not a fair risk indicator uh, when your portfolio of loans has changed so much in such a short time. Um, so Giovanna, would you mind speaking a little bit to that? Sure, I think that's a great point and something that we think about a lot. Uh, Kiva really cares about transparency and we want to ensure that our lenders understand um, the types of loans that they're funding and um, what the potential risk is. And internally at Kiva, we um, really want to manage that as well. I think one of the things that we're um, looking at very carefully is not just our overall repayment rate, because as you know, you, you mentioned, Brandon, that's a historical of all of Kiva, and it could take a really long time and a lot of big losses from a certain few partners before that rate even budges a little bit. Um, so we're trying to um, manage to some more leading indicators of um, our portfolio to get a sense of is there something that's going to go wrong um, that we need to manage before we um, you know, push more and more risk onto our lenders. Um, so that's something that we're monitoring very carefully. And right now, you know, the majority of our portfolio is still kind of the bread and butter microfinance um, that is going to see about the same um, levels of repayment that we've been seeing. Um, that being said, you know, there's a lot of variety of loans on the site right now, which we're really excited about. We believe in, we believe um, provides um, a variety of different social impact around the world. And I think there are are many better ways that we can continue to inform and show to lenders um, the different kinds of loans and what the potential risk of the different loans are. Um, right now, um, lenders should refer to um, the loan alert text um, on the profile page um, where we put uh, all the information that we know through our due diligence process about anything that might um, lead to increased risk um, and uh, of that loan product, uh, but internally we are thinking about and, and want to give more thought to um, how we can display that more easily and clearly to our lenders. That's great. Thanks. Um, so just a quick time check. Um, it's about 10 till. And uh, I actually wanted to check back with um, Ruben real quick. Um, mm -hmm. No worries if you don't have any extra questions, but just wanted to give you an opportunity um, if you wanted to ask one more before we uh, get toward wrapping up. 
Um, yeah, I actually have a question for Johnny. Um, you mentioned that um, the connection between the borrowers and the lenders uh, with Kiva Zip is, you know, pretty intense, so to speak. Um, isn't it maybe perhaps um, more interesting to launch Kiva Zip in like European countries where, you know, the the connection between the borrowers and the lenders can be that intensive because for me um, I see a lot of uh, USA and Kenyan loans and that's not really interesting for me as someone who lives in Europe. Uh, maybe if I saw a loan somewhere in, in Germany of, or here in the Netherlands for someone opening a coffee shop or something that would be more interesting for me. Yeah, I like that Ruben. It sounds like a self-interested question. I like <laughs> um, yeah, actually, uh, we, that's certainly an option that we're considering as well. You you might be able to tell from my accent, I'm from the UK. So yeah. I would I would love to see Kiva Zip loans supporting um, entrepreneurs in you know economically um, kind of depressed areas in the in the UK or social entrepreneurs mm -hmm. in the UK. Uh, we're actually talking to some folks in Ireland um, about whether that could be a, a place that um, Kiva Zip launches in in the next couple of years. Um, I think a lot of tech companies have, um, have European hubs in Ireland, um, and there'll be kind of linguistic um, synergies there as well. So yeah, it's set um, European countries. You know, the, the European Union makes it pretty easy once you're based in one country to operate in whatever it is, 20 or so others, which mm -hmm. is very attractive as well. So certainly um, an option that we're considering, yeah. Good. Great. Um, so I think we probably have time for just one more question. Um, I have one from uh, Astrid here. Um, and uh, they were asking, uh, is there a way for Kiva to detect delinquencies um, where they can investigate them before they get to kind of a, a bigger issue? So is there, um, are there mechanisms in place where we can kind of start to pay attention to maybe um, a smaller number of delinquencies that are happening with a particular partner and check into that? Definitely. Um, we monitor, as I said, not just the repayment rate overall of the portfolio, but partner by partner um, delinquency. And then um, we've been starting to look at delinquency by loan product that they post on Kiva. Um, and what we look at is a PAR, a portfolio at risk. And what that means is um, uh, delinquency really looks at what's the, um, or delinquency rate would generally look at um, an arrears number, which is the amount that that person has not missed, that has missed the payment. So if it's a $50 payment, that's the amount that's delinquent. Um, but uh, what a portfolio at risk rate number will look like, will look at is, sure, they missed a $50 payment, but the amount outstanding left on that loan is, is um, $200. And um, that payment is actually 30 days late or is 60 days late. And so the whole $200 becomes at risk of not being repaid. So we look at that as an early indicator of what's the potential that could be at risk um, of not being repaid and how, how how old is the portfolio? What's the aging? That means how much of it is less than 30 days delinquent? Um, how much of it is more than 30 days? How much of it is more than 60 days? Um, it's generally considered that something that has um, progressed into particularly 60 or 90 days is um, very, very at risk. Um, but as you start looking at it from 0 to 30 to 60, you can see the progression and start to see ahead of time what are those buckets looking like? How are the buckets moving? from 0 to 30, 30 to 60, and so on. So you can get a sense of um, uh, an early predictor of, of delinquency. So those are the, the types of things that, that we look at, um, both in terms of um, the portfolio overall of our institutional partners, so not just what they post on Kiva. So we have a sense of if their overall portfolio at risk of their whole portfolio is really high or trending that way, then we can get a sense that maybe that's going to start happening on Kiva. Um, but we also look at it specifically to the loans that they post on Kiva. Great. Hey, Brandon, can I make a couple more comments on risk as well? Yeah, please go ahead. So, yeah, I just wanted to kind of, um, there have been two or three really good questions on risk, and I just wanted to uh, pick the Kiva Zip uh, perspective as well. Firstly, really important to note that Kiva Zip, um, partly because it's a new platform, uh, is definitely much more risky than, than lending on Kiva. 
So obviously the kind of cumulative repayment rate on $450 million of Kiva loans is 99%. Right now on Kiva Zip, it's, it's currently 89.5% in Kenya and 84.4% in the US. So it's significantly lower uh, than, than lending on Kiva. Um, we do try and be really transparent about that. So those uh, repayment rate stats are on our homepage, zip.kiva.org. Um, and whenever any lender, whether they're an existing Kiva lender or a new lender, signs up for a Zip account, we do try and disclose that this is a riskier, newer platform than, than lending on Kiva. Um, just going back, Sharon, to your question earlier about the trade-off um, between risk and social impact, I see there as being a very, a very strong trade-off there. Um, I think that um, you know, uh, we are, we are trying, we're striving both in Kenya and the United States to work with really kind of at-risk populations. That might be Somalian refugees or urban slum dwellers in Kenya, or it might be uh, ex-offenders or even homeless populations in the United States. Another good example is startups, actually. Startup businesses in the US really struggle to access capital um, from conventional channels um, because they are riskier. Um, but one of the things we hope we can do over time is to at least give lenders that option. And for me personally, if I have the choice of, of lending to an ex-offender um, and giving them the chance to rehabilitate themselves back into society, even if that's a 70% risk, it, it, it's kind of interesting to, to have that option. And I, I might be willing to take that risk. Um, but we, we really need to do a, a great job of continuing to try and be as transparent and highlight those risks as much as we can. Right. Great. Thanks, Johnny. Um, so we are at the end of the hour. Um, I first would like to thank everyone uh, that has come, both on the Kiva side um, and especially uh, a couple of lenders that joined us, Ruben and Sharon. Um, so thank you guys very, very much. Um, and Giovanna for taking on more than her share of questions. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, one quick reminder to the community, whoever's watching, um, we very much welcome feedback um, on these uh, Kiva Insights calls. So if you have any comments or suggestions about the format um, or anything else, please let us know. Uh, we check all the, uh, the Kiva lending teams, so we'll be looking forward to hearing from you. So thanks again for watching, and we'll see you next time. Thank you, Brad. GFDBA. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>